good. Uh, I'm Terry Lohman. I'm co-chair for Unitarian Universalists for a Just Economic Community. Uh, we have two reasons to want to support peace. One, of course, is the humanitarian reasons, but we also are involved with the environment. And the military is a major polluter and a major reason for climate change, particularly in our country where it's something like 10% of the carbon footprint is uh, caused by the military. And that's just a guess because the military doesn't pass any audits financially or environmentally or anything. So we we can only guess what it is. Uh, our guest speaker tonight is Curtis Bell. And I'd love to have him explain um, where, you know, he's part of this UUs for peace in the Middle East. Um, I hope he can explain what what their vision is and and uh, how it's important to you use. And it's nice to see a nice number of people here coming up on 30 people or so. And uh, so we can get some comments because my real goal here is to engage you use on this issue and uh, move us towards uh, concern for it and concern for the larger issue of U.S. wars and uh, U.S. Uh, imperialism. So it's it's an opportunity to uh, get feedback from UUs and uh, to interact with UUs on on this, uh, what I consider to be a sort of a central issue of its <clears throat> of uh, human rights in the world and uh, and of U.S. Uh, lack of support for those human rights. So. I'm. Uh, I live in Portland, Oregon. I'm a member of First Unitarian Church, and uh, it's the land of the Multnomah and the Chinook that lived here by the on the Willamette River before all the white people came. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Maybe I'll begin with a little discussion of myself. I was born in Bahrain, and I went to high school in Beirut, Lebanon, and that was in the early 50s. It was only a few years, maybe four years after 750,000 uh, Palestinians had been uh, forced out of Israel proper and to occupy camps in Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And there were many camps right around Beirut. I saw those camps. I visited them. And uh, to my young mind, uh, all these people living in tents at that time uh, seemed like a great wrong. Now most of the camps are solid buildings, but still they're rather slum-like and uh, massive unemployment and difficulties of all kinds for the Palestinians living in these camps. And... Uh, uh, so I was rather imprinted on the Palestinian side of this issue, <clears throat> but I didn't become really active uh, in the struggle for Palestinian rights until uh, 2008 or so when Operation Cast Lead occurred and uh, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 Palestinians were killed in the bombing by, by Israel. Um, and at that time, I began trying to move our church in Portland towards engagement on the issue. And I organized talks and luncheons uh, uh, after church, uh, like uh, one of them, for example, was taking the fear out of talking about Palestine, Israel. There's a lot of fear in the UU world about uh, talking about this issue. So that, uh, that, that uh, was an important topic. Uh, I joined uh, UUJME and went on a a delegation in 2011 to Palestine, Israel, about a 12-day delegation, and I led a delegation in 2015 to Palestine, Israel, and I became the president of uh, UUJME, and I did that for about six years up until the, the end of last year. And then finally, another connection with Palestine was that uh, I... Uh, 
spent uh, the fall of 2019, three months in Hebron with the Christian, it's now called the Community Peacemaker Team there that works to uh, tell people what's happening in the West Bank and to do what they can to uh, uh, protect people uh, who are uh, threatened. So uh, I would say for those who are new to this issue, I think that UUJMA is a good place for UUs to get involved. We've been a UU-related organization actually since 1971. And it, uh, in those early years, it was very difficult to speak up for Palestinian human rights without being immediately seen as uh, strident, as uh, rather uh, unwanted, as uh, as uh, and in fact perhaps uh, anti-Semitic. So, I think that's changed. I think people realize that criticism of what Israel is doing to the Palestinians is really not anti-Semitic. Um, uh, we work for the security of all people in Palestine and Israel. In practice, that means we work for Palestinians because the Palestinians are the people who are now and have been for decades oppressed by the Israeli system. We have about 26 chapters around the country, a newsletter and a website, uujme.org, with all manner of resources. We encourage new members and we encourage the formation of new chapters. So uh, I, to get into the specifics, I, I completely condemn the killing and hostage taking of civilians by Hamas on October 7 and the apparent uh, brutality of many of those attackers. Uh, it is true that the right of an occupied oppressed people to respond even with violence is enshrined in the UN Charter. And I wish that Hamas had limited its killing and hostage taking to Israeli soldiers and not to involve the killing of so many civilians, but they didn't and that is really quite too bad. Um, but one war crime doesn't excuse another. And the continuing Israeli bombing and blockade is very, very far from proportionate or targeted or uh, humane. I won't dwell on the horror being visited upon the people of Gaza very much at this moment. Uh, all of you who are listening, you're here because you're interested in this issue, because you read a lot about it and you know a lot about it already. Uh, so up, up to now, I've been rather reluctant to use the term genocide to describe Israeli oppression of Palestinians. But that word now seems appropriate and is used more and more, in fact, by some Israelis. Uh, and so I think it is appropriate. But even if you're not comfortable with using that word, I think you might be able to support the need for action to prevent, uh, prevent a genocide from, from occurring. But what else but a genocide can one call the, the medieval cutting off of food, water, medicine and fuel, electricity, uh, really like a siege, a medieval siege to a walled population of over 2 million people. What else can one call the bombing of apartment houses and homes with people in them with no warning? The bombing of hospitals, schools, mosques, clinics, killing of over 18,000 people. It's probably more than that because the numbers of people who are buried in the rubble haven't been counted, and we don't know how many thousand that might be. So surely the final count will be well over 20,000 people in just two months. The wounding of 40,000 people, the destruction of half the housing units in, in Gaza, creation of 2 million displaced people um, with not an insured safe place to be, the likelihood of starvation and infectious diseases in the absence of food, sanitation, and water is beginning to take its toll also. It's not quite like throwing a smallpox victim over the wall, but it's not too far from that. It seems that uh, to me and many that Israel wants to force the people of Gaza out of Gaza. Uh, Israeli intelligence has in fact proposed uh, a plan to do that, to move them into camps in the Sinai Desert. 
the President Sisi of Egypt has said he wouldn't permit that, but uh, he's desperate for loan forgiveness and for money, and he might well be bribed into doing that. The international community, in quotes, because usually by that is meant uh, the U.S. and Western Europe, might wring their hands, but would probably allow it to happen, allow the exodus of all of the people from Gaza into the Sinai to happen, uh, just as they allowed the first Nakba of 48 to happen and all the impressions since to continue. The alternative, Israel occupying a shattered Gaza militarily with two million angry, resentful people who now increasingly support Hamas, would seem a most unappealing prospect for Israel. Uh, General Austin, uh, head of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, called the Israeli ground invasion of Gaza a tactical success but a strategic mistake, and that may turn out to be true. The worldwide response to Israeli violence uh, in Gaza against the Palestinians has really been remarkable, really astounding. Uh, the recognition and the, uh, uh, of the human rights of Palestinians and the struggle for those rights has never been stronger in all the six decades or so, seven decades since 1948. And uh, Continuing demonstrations around the world, hundreds of thousands of participants in England, Germany, Spain, Pakistan, Turkey, Indonesia, Latin America. Ambassadors from as many countries have been recalled, and direct actions of all kinds have resulted in thousands of arrests. The parliaments of Algeria and Yemen have given permission to their executives to declare war on Israel. Calls for a ceasefire have come from churches, unions, United Nations, humanitarian organizations. I think the calls by the United Auto Workers and by teachers unions for ceasefires are especially noteworthy as they are major supporters of the Democratic Party consequences for the election next year. The heads of state of Australia, New Zealand, and Canada have just recently called for a ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, these are our strong allies. Uh, they have stated that the price of defeating Hamas cannot be the continuous suffering of all Palestinian civilians. The worldwide opposition to the violence being endured by the people of Gaza is reflected in the passage just a few days ago of a resolution by the UN General Assembly that called for an immediate ceasefire in a vote of 152 in favor to 10 against. The worldwide sympathy for Palestinians is, is really profound and, and felt. Um, but signs carried in demonstrations and statements, I think, make clear that the anger is directed not only at Israel, but also at other targets. The most immediate additional target is the United States and the governments of Western Europe that in the recent past, at least, have joined the U.S. in giving unconditional support to the Israeli attacks. Germany and England continue to do so. France no longer does so. Spain has rejected and called for a ceasefire. It's, so it's no longer quite as uniform in the European support for U.S. and Israeli war. Those are U.S. planes dropping U.S. bombs on Gaza. It's the use of the U.S. veto in the Security Council and U.S. intimidation of the International Criminal Court that prevents the world's people, what I would call the real international community, from stopping that horror in Gaza. The Center for Constitutional Rights here in the U.S. has in fact filed a lawsuit against U.S. officials for their complicity in the crime of genocide. This is not only an Israeli war on the Palestinians, but a U.S. war on them also, and the world now knows that. The major reason for U.S. support for Israel is probably geostrategic. Control of the Middle East with its oil and with all the major trade routes going through the region is viewed as essential for U.S. domination and imperialism that is mediated both militarily and through U.S. control of the world's financial system. Russia, China, and resistant regimes such as Iran must not be allowed to stay in 
the Middle East. Biden in the 1980s, in calling himself Zionist, said that if Israel didn't exist, we'd have to create it. Alexander Haig said Israel was our biggest U.S. aircraft carrier and one we didn't even have to pay for or provide sailors for. So the linkage between the U.S. military and the Israeli military is very deep and very strong. The U.S. and the people of the U.S. have paid a large price for those decades of unconditional support for Israel and will pay a still larger price for the continuation of this support in the current Israeli siege and war on Gaza. The chickens are rather coming home to roost for all those decades of support. One can easily specify some of the costs of current U.S. support. We all realize and it's widely speculated that the Democratic Party and candidate Biden could lose the election in 2024 through loss of Arab American and Muslim American votes, loss of progressive enthusiasm, loss of young people's votes. Polls show that only about 10% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 35 support Biden's Israeli policy. We're all afraid that Trump might actually win. A second cost uh, that is real is the risk of a catastrophic regional war a war that would be a good deal worse than the combined wars of Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria. Um, I That seems to be sort of faded into the background recently, but I listened to Trita Parsi this morning being interviewed by Peter Beinart about the danger of a regional war. Uh, you may know Trita Parsi as one of the leaders of the Quincy Institute and an Armenian, uh, Iranian uh, writer and thinker who is often in the news and uh, quite an excellent commentator, I think, very, very knowledgeable. He just came back from Doha, spoke, where he spoke on a, at a conference about Palestine. So I have a lot of respect for his opinion, and he is actually much more worried now about a regional war than he was a month or two ago when, right after October 7, he uh, believes that uh, Israel senses that a time is right to not only neutralize Hamas, but also neutralize Hezbollah. Hezbollah being a much more serious enemy for Israel than Hamas. As you may know, Hezbollah uh, is heavily, has hundreds of thousands of rockets and many of them with uh, direct uh, targeting ability uh, that could reach anywhere in Israel. Uh, it has a battle-hardened army of tens of thousands of men, uh, and uh, it is a, could be a real uh, threat to, uh, to Israel. Uh, but he feels that Israel might feel that it's the time is right now to uh, try to neutralize another enemy also, and uh, this is very concerning. Neither Hezbollah nor Iran want a war, Hezbollah's the war in 19, uh, uh, 2006 in Lebanon was very, very damaging. Bridges were blown up by Israel all over Lebanon. There was much, much damage. Hezbollah would not go lightly into a war, which we know would come with much damage to Lebanon. But if they feel like Israel is about to attack, they might feel necessary to begin the war uh, if it's going to come uh, regardless. So that's a larger concern than I had thought about before hearing from Trita Parsi. A third important cost is the loss of U.S. soft power, diplomatic power in negotiating with uh, other countries and in trade agreements and so forth. The Arab world and much of the global South clearly recognize U.S. hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is seen in U.S. support for immediate censuring of Russia for its invasion of the Ukraine by the U.N. Security Council and the International Criminal Court and the complete lack of such support for censuring Israel for similar crimes decade after decade. The U.S. won't be welcomed uh, diplomatically and its so-called international rule-based order, which it has pushed as an, as an alternative to existing international law, will have little or, or no respect. So this loss of soft power, 
respect for the U.S. I think is one of the costs that is being paid by this worldwide opposition to what's going on uh, by the U.S. and Israeli war on Gaza. A fourth cost is what's happening here at home. We all are aware of an increase in Islamophobia and anti-Semitism in the U.S., as well as the McCarthy-like attacks on free speech and freedom of assembly in the U.S. I th believe that the energy behind the worldwide protests goes even deeper than antagonism to Israel for its war on the people of Gaza and the antagonism against the U.S. for its complicity in that war. Although those are the immediate foci of the protests, one senses that people of the world, many of whom have only recently extricated themselves from colonialism, are fed up with colonialism, with militarism, and with a world economic system dominated by the interests of the U.S. and Western Europe. They're calling for a multipolar, they want and call for a multipolar world, a world without endless wars, and a world with respect for the human rights of all people. I think that's the world we all want, a world in which the truly existential issues of climate change, nuclear war, and inequality, for example, are confronted with the seriousness that they really require, and in which the world's resources of money and attention aren't wasted on geostrategic imperialist antagonisms and wars. I would suppose that most of you also want such a world and want the continuing humanitarian horror in Gaza to stop. It behooves us then to ask how we can take advantage of the current worldwide activism to end Israeli violence, end U.S. complicity in that violence, and move us toward a world we desperately need and want. A partial answer to this question of how we can take advantage of the worldwide increase in activism is that our actions must not stop, must be broad-based, and must be multi-pronged. First, the actions, the sit-ins, the protests must not stop. They can't be just temporary. They must continue. We can't just go home from the protests and allow the politicians to continue uh, ignoring us. In the words of Tom Paine, this is no time for sunshine citizens or summer patriots. Uh, second, we must create a broadly based movement by persuading all manner of civil society groups, healthcare workers, unions, educators, professional organizations, religious groups, where their true interests lie. Finally, all manner of nonviolent action should be pursued, including demonstrations, boycotts, divestments, sit ins, sanctions, and congressional advocacy. We don't know what finally will make a difference. But economic pressure does seem especially important, as that was what persuaded South Africa to end apartheid, for example. I know I'm speaking to you use for a just economic community, and economics is certainly a major front in this struggle. I'll close by speaking a little bit about how Unitarian Universalism fits into all this. I think most of us here are Unitarians. And... Uh, uh, until recently, I've been pretty discouraged about the possibility of UU engagement in the struggle for Palestinian human rights. Speaking with Reverend Bill Sinkford, who was our senior minister here in Portland for a time and former UUA president, he once told me that no other issue is as laden with conflict among Unitarian Universalists as the Palestinian-Israeli issue. And neither ministers nor congregations like conflict. UUJME has learned, in fact, of many UU congregations where education and advocacy for Palestinian rights are really not allowed. It's not that nothing has been said or done. In the early 80s, UU resolutions were passed calling for an end to the occupation of the West Bank and declaring that criticism of the actions of the State of Israel is not anti-Semitic or not anti-Semitic. And in 2002, a resolution was passed again calling for an end to the occupation 
and obedience to international law. But in general, I felt for many years, many of the past years, that the social justice concerns of most UUs are largely domestic with issues such as reproductive rights, racism, democracy, LGBTQI rights, and the environment. Issues such as U.S. responsibility for human rights violations abroad and U.S. militarist foreign policy and imperialism that causes so much harm and has taken so many resources haven't been given much attention in UU circles. It's not that the domestic issues are not really important. They are very important, but only that there also needs to be room for concerns beyond our borders. I did write a piece that's on our website about this, but uh, that's still there. But lately there seems to be an awakening among UUs concerning the human rights of Palestinians, especially since October 7. But uh, even in 2021, the UUSC declared that no more military aid should go to Israel until Israel respects the human rights of Palestinians and obeys international law. Unfortunately, the UUSC, although it made that clear statement of their position, hasn't really uh, been willing to make that a major part of their effort. Maybe that can change, and I hope so. But more recently, on October 17, the UUA called for an immediate ceasefire and obedience to international law. And Reverend Sophia Betancourt, president of the UUA, signed on to a letter with other faith leaders from Churches for Middle East Peace to President Biden calling for a ceasefire and restraint by all involved. That involved, I think, like 25 different church, major church leaders uh, around the country. The UUA is one of the founding members of the Churches for Middle East Peace. Black Lives of UU and diverse revolutionary, Unitarian, Universalist, multicultural ministries, DRUM, have also both called for a ceasefire and an end to U.S. military aid to Israel. A group called UU Religious Leaders for Palestine is holding webinars each Sunday where people can learn and reflect on what is happening in Palestine, Gaza. And an entire two-hour webinar about UUs in Gaza was held by the Article 2 Commission yesterday. Over 100 people attended it and over 100 people attend these um, UU Religious Educators well, webinars. This uh, webinar yesterday was held by the Article 2 Commission as the third of its theological panel discussions on covenant and the whole two hours was devoted to UUs in Palestine, Israel. So I think we can, and I'm, it's quite touching to me, having worked for movement of UUs onto this issue for some years now, that there's this ferment, this readiness to confront uh, U.S. engagement uh, with uh, Israeli oppression, uh, and especially right now with engagement with U.S. with uh, support for Israeli violence. So there's real ferment within the UU community, especially among its leaders in support of peace and human rights. Our task really is to broaden and deepen that ferment so that the voices of the whole UU community, of the large part of the UU community are heard in the halls of power. We have a chance of creating real change in collaboration with others by increasing the power of our voices. So there's really the the one power that civil society has is the power of the vote, the power of uh, those people in Congress. They depend on money from large donors, but they also depend on votes from us. And that is where our power lies. <clears throat> people might ask, what can I do? As an individual, not much, but in association with others, a great deal. You can join an activist organization such as UUJME or Jewish Voice for Peace 
or the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights or American Friends Service Committee. By the way, you don't have to be Jewish to join Jewish Voice for Peace. I'll make available a PDF with information on how to join these organizations and include some other resources also. So I think I'll stop there and get some suggestions, comments, and questions from all of you and uh, hope that you'll join us in this uh, in one way or another, however you feel you can uh, in this struggle for a world that uh, we all really want. So thanks very much. Thanks for listening.